Okay, welcome everybody. We're continuing our study of the book of Shemuel. We transitioned into Shemuel Bet. We're on chapter two of Shemuel Bet. If you want to follow us in the Rabbi Sachs Hebrew English, it's on page 719 towards the top of the page. Um, so chapter one of Shemuel Bet was our final goodbye, our, our uh, last lamentations towards Shaul and his children who died in battle. We saw David's emotional state towards that. And now we're about to get into several chapters that are gonna deal with the aftermath now, transitioning to the kingdom of David. Now, we've been on pins and needles since the moment David uh, was crowned as king while Shaul was still king. How long is this gonna go on? The back and forth, Shaul and David's feud. Finally, Shaul has passed away. And so we as the reader are like, all right, David's going to step into the limelight. He's going to take over. His kingdom is going to be perfect and everything's going to be all peaches and cream. Well, as we know, politics doesn't work that way and things never work that way. Um, Shaul, although he died and his three sons died, as we will soon see, he has one remaining son who did not go to the battle. And people who are loyal to Shaul and his camp are not so quick, despite whatever prophecies people have and annoying things that have happened in the past, to just let the kingdom of Shaul go and transition to somebody else. So now what we're going to deal with in these next chapters is the struggle over who is going to legitimately claim the monarchy in the wake of Shaul's death. And typically monarchies go to the children, which is why a natural answer for many people is going to be the remaining child of Shaul should take over. However, we know David was crowned as king and so people will be in David's camp. And now we will see a struggle for uh, David uniting the camp under his legitimate um, successorship from Shaul, how that's going to happen. And it's not going to be an easy transition. It's actually going to be, as we will see in this chapter, a very bloody transition, which typically happens when you have conflict over the monarchy. Um, so that's what we should keep in the back of our mind over these next few chapters. And it starts with a very strange incident, a very bizarre story that takes place here in chapter two. But before we get to that, we see David's perspective on the situation um, and what God tells him to do and a nice story uh, with the people of Yavesh Gilad. So let's begin reading the chapter. As I said, page 719, chapter two of Shemuel Bet. After Shaul has passed away and David laments his passing, David God seeks counsel from God. I should say David seeks counsel from God. He wants to know God, what's my next move? Should I go and establish a stronghold in one of the cities of Yehuda? Which makes sense because David is from the tribe of Yehuda. So connect with your brothers. God responds to him, yes, go up. We've typically seen responses from God to David are in the form of like one word. Very, very short. That's through the Urim Vitumin. David David responds a second time and asks a question and says, so where exactly should I go? Vayomer Hevrona. He should go to Hevron, says God. Now it's worth noting over here, in the past we've discussed heavily how you ask questions of God from the Urim Bitumim. Remember we saw many chapters ago, um, all the way when the Nov situation was happening, that David may have erred in the way he asked questions to the Urim Bitumim, asking questions in rapid succession, more than one at a time, not in the proper order. We note that David here, it certainly learned from his mistake. You could see how he methodically asks questions one at a time, waits for a response and does so in the proper order and waits to receive that response. So this is a classic of David fixing his errors that he's made in the past and doing them the right way in the next time around. Verse two, Vayal sham David vegam sheten asham. David goes up together with his two wives these are the wives that we've seen with him pretty consistently, always noting Michal's absence. She's been given to somebody else and stayed behind in the camp of Shaul. Verse 3, The men who were with David, he takes up with him, each man and his family. And they sit and dwell in the cities of Hebron. Verse 4, Vayavo and She Yehuda, the men of Yehuda come and are rallied around David. Vayim Shechu Sham et David Lemelech al Bet Yehuda. They anoint David as the king over the house of Yehuda. They make a formal crowning of David as king. 
beyond what Shemuel has already done. Uh, and they say to David, Something great happened from the people of Yavesh Gilad who buried Shaul. In other words, David, you have to, uh, you should be informed about what the people of Yavesh Gilad did in taking upon themselves this mission, putting themselves at risk to bury the bodies of Shaul and his children. So let's take a pause for just a moment and notice uh, something important. A, a milat mancha, a recurring word that appears in just these four verses, we can learn a lot from recurring words, is the word Allah, the shoresh ayin lamin hey, to go up. David asks, ha e should I go up? God answers him, ale, go up. He says to him, Anna e'ele, where should I go up? Vaya'al sham David, David goes up to Hebron. And then it says the pen who were with him went up to Hebron. The word Allah appears five times in just these four verses. And that's because David is ascending. The text is telling us that David is on the rise. His, his uh, popularity, the way people are thinking of him is now on the rise after Shaul has passed away. And it's now David's turn and time to ascend and to take over the throne. So David's stock is going up, hence the term over here of Allah. That's one thing that is worth pointing out. A second question that we have to ask is, um, why Hebron? Why does David get the advice from God to go to Hebron of all places? So I think there's two answers to this question. One answer is strategically it makes a lot of sense because as we noted, Hebron is in the tribe of Yehuda. Yehuda are the members of David's own people. If you're going to rally your base to start spreading the word about your kingdom, you're gonna to go to your people first and you're gonna rally them. It's like, a, it's like a political candidate who wants to run for president. You're gonna to go to your home state, right? If your home state is Florida, if your home state is North Carolina, whatever it is, that's the first place you're gonna go. If you can't get the people in your own home state, to vote for you, then chances are you have no business being the president of the United States. David's gonna to go to Hebron, it's his home, home spot, it's the people of Yehuda, and he's gonna to try to galvanize and build his base through that. But a second reason that makes sense to go to Hebron is because of the religious significance of Hebron. What is the religious significance of Hebron? That's the place of our ancestors, our forefathers, right? Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, their wives, their spouses are there. So. Anytime a person wants to ascend the throne or be important, it's important to connect religiously with the, the, the past, the history of the Jewish people. So it makes sense that David would choose a significant city, a religiously significant city like Hebron, to build his base before he's going to go out and spread himself to the other people amongst Am Yisrael. Keep that idea in mind when we see how there'll be a struggle later in the chapter over a place called Giv'on. We'll leave that on the side and we'll revisit this point as well, that when you want to make your case for being the leader, you're going to do so from a significantly religious city. There has not been. We have not seen one, right? It seems people know. It seems this is the first big public announcement that the people of Yehuda would do something like that. Not on, not on that, right. Not the way, certainly not the way it was done with Shaul, right? If we go all the way back to chapters uh, 7, 8, and 9 of the Shemuel Aleph, Shaul was clearly crowned as king before the entire people in the mitzvah with everybody together. David did not have that. He was quietly crowned as king, anointed as king by Shemuel. There's been a lot of whispers. People know the confrontation between Shaul and David. And now David gets really his first public appearance and crowned as king, but it's amongst only his people, the people of Yehuda. And as we'll see, David will spend seven years ruling just the people of Yehuda before he actually ascends the throne to rule over the rest of the Jewish people for the next 33 years. In total, he'll be king for 40 years, seven of which was just for the people of Yehuda. The other 33 is for the rest of the Jewish people. That's because this conflict about gaining the unanimous, united leadership of the Jewish people will take him some time. Yeah. Let's continue to verse five. So we just left off with the fact that David was informed about the actions of Yavesh Gilad, um, who um, risked their lives to bury Shaul in a respectable way. So David wants to make sure that they are accredited with this action. 
וישלח דוד מלאכים אל אנשי יבש גלעד. דוד sends messengers to the men of יבש גלעד, ויאמר עליהם, and he says to them, ברוכים אתם לאדוני, blessed are you to God, אשר עשיתם החסד הזה, that you have done this great kindness, עם אדוניכם, עם שאול, with your master, with שאול, ותקברו אותו, and you were able to go and bury him respectfully. Verse 6, ואתה, and now, יעש אדוני עמכם חסד ואמת, God shall perform with you, מידה כנגד מידה, measure for measure, kindness of truth. וגם אנוכי אעשה איתכם הטובה הזאת. And I too, David, will always perform goodness with you, אשר עשיתם הדבר הזה, for the fact that you have done this as well. Verse 7, ואתה, and now, תחזקנה ידיכם. Take courage and be brave. והיו לבני חיים, and become brave men. כי מת אדוניכם שאול, because your master שאול, has perished. And also I have been crowned um, over as king over the people, excuse me, the people of Yehuda. So let's pause here. This is an interesting interlude over here. David sends messengers. He gives tremendous accolades to the people of, of Anshei Avesh Kil'an over this great and heroic act, act of bravery and courage that they did to bring Shaul and his children back and to give them proper burial and to respect them. And he says, because you did this kindness, Hashem should continue to do kindness with you. Um, but now it's time to move on at the end, he says. You've lost your master, and now I've been crowned as king. So why is this story here? Why is this little interlude here before we get to the remainder of the chapter, which is going to really discuss a struggle between David's camp and Shaul's camp? Why is this little story told to us here? What's its significance? What, we, what might you think? Yeah. Your Lord, and then he says, Shaul, Hashem. And I'm wondering, so he's saying that you perform this for Hashem, to honor Hashem's wishes, as well as for Shaul, and then he's saying maybe now, this is Hashem's wish, because you, you honor God first. You're saying Adonechem is a reference to God. Um, so that's not the typical way I would have interpreted it. It's not terrible, right? Im Adonechem im Shaul. Um, Later, he's going to use Hashem's actual name. I don't think Adonechem over here is a reference to God necessarily. I think it's a reference to their master, to Shaul. But it is interesting that you brought that up in that way because he does say it twice. He calls Adonechem Shaul, im Adonechem im Shaul. David is stressing the point that he's respectful of the fact that the people of Yavesh Gilad look at Shaul as their Adon, as their master. They looked at him as their leader. And David wants to be courteous to them on, on that matter, right? So he doesn't want to belittle Shaul in their eyes. He wants to say, I see what you did. I see the way you treated somebody who you respected, who you feel, felt was your master. I think that is very important. Correct. Ah, so that's one big point. The big point here is at the end, David is yes, trying to garner support from the people of Yavesh Gilad, praising them for their actions, but is also now at the very end kind of hinting to them, as I said, but it's time to move on. In other words, I'm now the person who's going to take over, and I want you to throw your support behind me the way you threw your support behind Shaul, right? And so that might be what David is saying. He's using this opportunity um, and I don't want to use that, pretend that that is manipulating them or anything like that. But he's saying, I have an opportunity. Here are some great people who clearly show tremendous loyalty and know right from wrong and know how to respect the leader. These are people that I want to get into my camp. These are people that I want their support. So he's reaching out to them, giving them tremendous praise, blessing them, and then saying, now is my time to take over for Shaul. I want you to throw your support behind me with the type of bravery and courage that you threw your support behind Shaul. And I think that from a political perspective, that makes a lot of sense on the part of David. The people of Yavesh Gilad and the Pilegish Begiva story were the ones who did not come out to fight against Binyamin because they were brothers with Binyamin, right? So they didn't come and fight in that civil war and the rabbis were very upset at them for that. They ended up taking a tremendous vengeance against Yavesh Gilad, and then they used that as a way to take their women to marry them with the people of Binyamin to, uh, to solve the 
crisis of there's no better people to, uh, to, to replenish the tribe of Binyamin, which means that Yavesh Gilad and Binyamin have a very strong relationship with each other, which makes sense because Shaul is from Binyamin. That's why they threw their support and were willing to go to such length towards Shaul and Shaul threw his support on them in the story of Nachash Amoni when he saved them because Nachash was coming after them. So there's a clear bond and a relationship between Binyamin and Yavesh Gilad and Shaul and David is trying to tap into that a little bit. Yeah. But I think there's one other point that this story really teaches us. And I think it's a bit, it's a more broad point. You notice that David is talking a lot about chesed. He's talking a lot about kindness. What strikes David is the kindness of Yavesh Gilad. And David, in the early stages of his monarchy, wants to establish what his kingdom is going to be about. What does David want his kingdom to be about? He wants it to be about chesed, about doing the right thing for people who do the right thing, right? And so David is all about that. Now, what's very interesting is, where does David come from? What's his genealogy? His genealogy is root. The language that David uses over here, for those who are familiar with Megillat Rut, is very, very reminiscent of Naomi and Ruth and their conversation. I think it's actually worth, if you have a Tanakh in front of us, taking a moment and just leave your finger on the place here and go to Megillat Ruth. If you have um, Megillat Ruth, if you have my book, so you could turn to, um, you could turn, it's, I think it's in chapter one, chapter one or early in chapter two. Um, yeah. It's actually in chapter two, I think. Yeah, chapter two. Is there also some in chapter one as well? Yeah, exactly. It's when Naomi is speaking to Ruth and Orpah and trying to get them to go back home after Ruth and Orpah stay there, what? Yes, yes. Yes, there is, I am on the Zoom. So go to page 1677. Oh, so go to Ruth chapter two. Ruth chapter two. Um, if you take a look, actually, no, yeah, let's go to first to chapter one. I'm losing my, uh, I'm losing my bearings over here. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, is it, is it, is it, is it, is it, uh, ah, yes, verse eight, chapter one, let's go first to chapter one, verse eight, right? Um, it says, Vatomen Naomi Lishtechaloteha. Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Lech Nashovna, go back and return. Isha lebet ima, each woman to the house of her mother. Yaas Adonai imachem chesed. God should do with you kindness. Kasher asitem imha metim imadi, as you have done with those who have perished, meaning my two sons who you married, and with me. Um, and she continues on that train as well. Um, later on, if we go now, if we fast forward now to chapter two, when Boaz is speaking to Ruth and talking about what he heard about Ruth, he too talks about the idea of chesed. He says, uh, Ruth actually comes home, uh, sorry, uh, I'll say where, uh, he says, it was told to me all of the great things that you did towards your mother-in-law, after your husband had passed away and you left your parents' home to come to a place that you don't know. Yeshalem Adonai Pa'olev, God should repay you for your actions. Utimas kurtech shalema mi'im Adonai Elohei Israel, let your reward be full from the God of the Lord of Israel. Later on, when she's telling, when Ruth is telling Naomi about what happened um, in chapter 2, verse 20. Chapter 2, verse 20 of Ruth, it says, Vatomen Naomi lechalata, Naomi says to her daughter-in-law, Baruch Hu Adonai, blessed be that man, Boaz, Asher lo azav hasdo, whose kindness did not abandon us, et hachayim et hametim, with those who are alive and those who have passed away. The word chesed is a key word of Megillat Rut. And in fact, the rabbis say, when they talk about Megillat Rut, they say, why was this book even written? They say, Megillat Rut doesn't have any halachot, doesn't have any miracles. It doesn't have any salvation for the Jewish people. It's not the story of Purim. It's not the story, what is it? Why do we even have it? Why is it written? And the only thing that the rabbis come up with is to show you the reward for chesed. To show you what happens to people who do chesed. People like Ruth, people like Naomi, people like Boaz, when they do chesed, what's the result? David. That's the result. David. So it makes sense that David, who, has, who comes from this seed, who his whole existence 
is based upon the chesed of his forefathers and his ancestors, his grandmother and so on, that he would want to make the hallmark of his kingdom the idea of chesed. So when he finds out that the people of Yavesh Gilad have done such a brave, courageous act of chesed, he must highlight it. He must tell them. And he wants to tell them, what you guys do is the type of kingdom that I want to build. I want to build a kingdom where more and more people act like you, because that's what we are, what we're all about. That's what I'm about. That's where I come from. It's all about chesed. And as we go through the stories of David, we will consistently point out all of the kindnesses that David will do. We will see chesed after chesed that David will do with person after person who helps him despite all of the challenges that David will, will have to deal with. So we keep those things. These are the early seeds that are being planted of what David is, what his kingdom will stand for, who he is, that I think are important to keep in mind as we go through the rest of the book talking about his kingdom. Let's now move to... Pasuk 8, pas, uh, verse 8, Pasuk Het. Now we're going to get into a little bit of the conflict. What happens? The Avner ben Ner, a man by the name of Avner, son of Ner, Sar Tzava Asher Shaul, who was the chief general of Shaul, Lakah et Ish Boshet ben Shaul. He took Ish Boshet, the son of Shaul. Apparently Shaul left behind one of his sons who did not go to battle. And he brings him to a place, Mahanaim. Now, anybody know what Mahanaim is? Or where that comes up in the Torah? Yaakov Avinu. That was the place where Yaakov met the angels. The second time, as he was re-entering the land of Eretz Israel, he sees the angels coming back to him, and he names the place Mahanaim. So that's where he goes to now to, to, uh, to, to build his spot. So as I mentioned before, whenever you want to garner your support and build your camp, you're going to try to do it from a religiously powered city, which is Machanaim. Bayamlichehu el Hagilad, I'm in verse 9 now, he says, Bayamlichehu el Hagilad, he crowned him as king on Gilad, the El Ashuri, the El Yisrael, the Al Ephraim, the Al Binyamin, the Al Israel Kulo. And Avner proclaims Ishboshet, the take the next king, over all of these different places and over all of the Jewish people. Right? Avner is not dumb. He knows what happens with David. Remember, Avner was the one who David yelled at him when he wasn't protecting Shaul a few chapters ago, when David snuck into the camp with Avishai and they were ready to kill Shaul. Shaul was sleeping and all of the people were around him and David didn't kill him. And then David yelled at him from the mountain. He said, Avner, you should be, you should be liable for death because you didn't take care of Shaul. Avner knows what's going on. He's not going to waste time. He wants to continue the kingdom of Shaul. That's who he pledged loyalty to. That's where his support is. And so therefore, he grabs Ishboshet, the one and only remaining son, and he crowns him as king. A, a, a brazen act on the part of Avner, knowing what God really has in store and who should really be taking over and whom he knows should really be taking over. So at this point, Avner is what type of a character? How would we, where would we put it in? He's devious, deceitful. Um, he's in the negative, right? Certainly he's, uh, he's one of the negative characters so far, and he will only continue to, to look, be looked at from that way. Another thing that's important is to know Ishboshet. What is our impressions of him? What would we say about him? Not so bright. bright. What'd you say? He's weak. How do you know he's weak? Exactly. So A, where wasn't he? Last, last thing. He was not on the war in the battlefield, right? So he was left behind. So he might be very young. Maybe he's a teenager. Maybe he's not worthy of battle, but he's certainly, what? Later it will say he's been at Ba'im Shana when he takes over. So clearly he's not a teenager. He's not young. But for some reason, a 40-year-old who's not in battle together with his father and his other brothers, that doesn't paint him as very good. Not only that, he doesn't make the initiative to crown himself as king. Avnan has to kind of pull him by the arm and say, all right, let's go. Um, he takes him. He crowns him. Who's doing it? Every, Avner is the pusher. Avner is the mover. Basically, Ishboshet is a puppet, right? Avner needs to keep it going, and he wants to maintain his power because Avner is the chief general of Shaul. If David becomes the king, David's going to take on a new cabinet, right? So you're looking at two presidents fighting over the presidency, and this is the secretary of state who wants to keep his job as Secretary of State, and if the other president takes over, he's not. So he puts a puppet regime of this guy Ishboshet. Even his name. What does his name mean? It's it's a it's 
Busha comes, it's the, it's the man of embarrassment, the man of shame, right? Busha. Actually, some people say his name was the name of Abu Dazara. It was Ish Baal. But because we don't use the name of Abu Dazara, we actually call him uh, Ish, Ish Boshet. Like we talk in embarrassment and shame over the Abu Dazara. So our impressions of Ish Boshet are he's weak. He's a puppet. Avner is the strong, devious guy who's trying to oppose David. And the conflict now is set up for what's going to happen. Anything, anything else to add or anything else you notice? Okay, let's go to verse 10. Pasuk Yod. Ben Arba'im Shana Ishboshet ben Shaul ben Molcho an Israel. Ishboshet is 40 years old um, when he takes over as king of Israel by Avner's admission. Ushtaim Shanim Malach. And he only rules for two years. Ach bet Yehuda hayu achare David. But the house of Yehuda, they were supportive of David. They followed. So this is the earliest sort of, yeah, we're getting it. We're going to get to some civil war. It's the earliest schism that we have in the monarchy of the Jewish people already there. Now, David is going to do everything he can to not allow the kingdom to be torn apart. The irony of which is that after his son, Shaul, it will eventually be torn apart. But the kingdom of the Jewish people is just ripe for being split, right? For tension, right? That's, that's just our problem. It's just always been that way. And it just seems to always be plaguing us, which is our lack of unity, our inability to get together and make a unified decision. So already we're feeling the tension that, wow, this could result in a two kingdom. The greatness of David is going to try to put everything together and he'll be successful at doing that, at least for a generation or two. Shaul, remember we had a whole thing about Shaul when he became king. Remember it said, Ben Shtaim, Shanim, Shaul de Molcho, he was only two years old, but then we said, how is it possible? So we don't really get an accurate depiction of how old Shaul was. He was clearly old. Hard claim. Right, that would basically mean that, uh, I don't know, it's, it's a hard, yeah, I don't know, it's... Shaul at this point must have been 16. Let's say he's 16, but that means he became king when he was 58, right? Which the text doesn't tell us. If you, if you assume he ruled for two years. But we already said that he didn't rule for two years. Right, well, some people said he was two years before David was anointed and then his kingdom reigns for much, much longer than that. The timeline of Shaul was very, um, was very hazy, right? Because of that very cryptic pasuk, how long did he really rule independently versus ruling while David was still king? Um, what were the rabbis trying to, what was the, the Tanakh telling us? It was very, very strange. It, all, the whole thing was very odd. He gets the impression he's young, but he's definitely not a baby, right? He, he's, but he's right. Right. But then you have to say that he ruled for quite a bit of time before he gets to a son who's 40 years old to take over the kingdom, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's likely that Shaul reigned a lot longer than the text had told us, and that you'd have to find a way to understand how the things happened uh, during that time. Um, verse 11. The number of days, the length of time that David was king over Hebron on the tribe of Yehuda, Sheva Shanim Vishisha Chodashim, for seven years and six months. So, seven and a half years. David was king over the people of Yehuda before he ascended the throne and was recognized for all the people. So already getting some uh, foreshadowing for what's going to be um, as, we go, as we go ahead. Now comes the real insane story. Finally, the, the, the people of the Avner Bener and his people and the servants of Ishboshet go out from Machanaim, and they take hold in Giv'on. Now, we're going to have to explain what Giv'on is. Before we do that, let's read a little bit more of the story. Pasuk Yud Gimal. Ve'yo'av ben Tziruya ve'avde David yatsu. Yo'av, the son of Tziruya, and the servants of David also went out. Ve'yif Geshu, excuse me, they, they met up al berechat Giv'on yachdav. By a pool of water, right? A natural body of water, some kind of lake or something. By Giv'on, they meet up. And this legion sat on one side of the pool and the other one sat on the other side of the pool. So there's, we're setting up a what here? A meeting, uh, I'd say a confrontation, right? Basically a confrontation. Yoav and his men, Yoav is the chief general of David. Avner is the chief general of Shaul. 
and their servants and their people are now together, arms in hand, weapons at the ready, and they're sitting at, casually on each side of the pool, right? But this is no casual meeting, as I think we're going to try and explain a little bit. This was calculated by certain people that this should happen to set up some kind of a confrontation between the two of them. This confrontation does not go well. I want to read more of the story and just keep it in the back of our minds. Who would you blame for what takes place here in this story? You let me know. Bayomer Avner el Yoav. Avner calls to Yoav and says, Yakumu naha ne'arim. Let the young lads get up, the sahaku fanenu, and let them sport before us. Let's have a play fight. Bayomer Yoav, Yakumu. Yoav said, Yeah, let's do it. Get up. Now, there's no such thing as like a play fight, but they're going to. They're going to battle it out a little bit, right? They're going to pick young men to, to have a little bit of a fight here, right? I don't know that they want, they think that this is going to result in anybody really dying, but it's going to be a confrontation. It's going to be a physical battle. Verse 15, They came forward and they were counted off. 12 people for Binyamin, and for Ishboshet, the son of Shaul, and 12 from the people of David. So they're going to select 12 young people, 12 of their best fighters from each side to battle it out while everyone else watches. So by the way, we have a stalemate, two sides of the camp, and we're selecting a group within that to battle out to see who the winner is. Chances are whoever wins gets to stay. Whoever loses has to leave. Does this sound like anything that we know? When did we have, what else did we have a confrontation between two sides who didn't want to fight each other for fear of dying and sent one or a few other people together to meet each other. The story of Goliath, right? This is re re replaying the story of David and Goliath, right? Two camps, the Pilishtim and the Jewish people on opposite sides, they don't want to fight each other for fear of bloodshed. So they're going to send one person to battle it out and whoever wins that battle, that's the winner. The Jewish people are doing that now amongst each other between Abner and Yoav. Why do they pick 12 people? What's the significance of 12? Ishradim. 12 is a very significant number for us. It represents the whole of Israel. It's almost like they're saying, whoever wins this battle, the other guy's got to retreat and the other one gets to be the king. I don't know that they said that outright, but it was sort of a, a hidden, an undertone message that was going on over here. Okay. Each one grasped his opponent's head and thrust his dagger into his opponent's side. And they thus fell together. In other words, a stalemate. And that place, which is in Givon, was eventually known as Chelkat Hatsurim. Chelkat from the language of Chelek, like division or parts, Hatsurim. Tsurim are like weapons and things. So in other words, they were divided amongst each other and there was a split. It was a stalemate. Nobody really won. But unlike the battle of Goliath, where when one person won, the other retreated, um, in this situation, the, the battle escalates and it gets out of hand far beyond what they originally intended. Verse 17, A fierce battle ensued on that day. And that's not a language that we find very often. This is about the only place where a battle takes place, even as we've seen tons of bloodshed and wars, um, where that language is used by the Tanakh. So it's particularly fierce and particularly damaging given the fact that it probably should have never happened in the first place. And Avner and his men are routed by David's soldiers. David's soldiers uh, seem to win the battle, right? It's not a full victory as we shall soon see, but it's clearly uh, the numbers favor them. Verse 18, Verse there were three brothers, all of whom who were the sons of Tziruya. The three brothers are named Yoav. We know him. He's the chief general of David. Va'avishai. We also know him. He was the one who came with David to sneak into the camp of Shaul when they were all sleeping, as I referenced earlier. And David had the opportunity to kill him. And Avishai wanted to kill him. And David said, no, we will not kill the Mashiach Hashem. So Avishai there also had a very intense experience where he wanted to kill Shaul. So we know Avishai. And the third one we don't know. He's new for us. The Asael. Okay, three brothers. 
The Asael Kal Beraglav, Asael was a very fast runner. Like a gazelle in the open field. So he was not your average soldier. He had a great skill. He was an incredibly fast runner. So what does he do? He chases. Asael chases after Avner. And he refused to swerve right or left from his pursuit of Avner. In other words, he's on his tail. He's gaining on him. He's chasing him. And Avner cannot shake him. And he refuses to go anywhere. He's, he's in a hot pursuit. Verse 20. Avner, as he's running away from him, turns his head towards him. And he calls out. Is that you, Asael? He says, yes, indeed, it's me. Verse 21. Avner tells him, Turn to the right or to the left. In other words, abandon the pursuit of me. And seize one of your young lads. And take off his cloak. In other words, get you know, abandon this chase. Go get one of your people, take his clothing, go do something with him. Leave me alone. Asael refused to abandon his pursuit of Avner. So generally speaking, when someone's being pursued by someone to kill him, what's going to be your default over here? Well, you're going to maybe try to run, but if you think that you can attack him, you're going to you're going to retaliate. You're going to kill him. If someone's in pursuit of you, you're going to kill him. Avner shows a little bit of restraint here. He does not want to kill Asael. So in verse 22, Avner makes a second attempt, a second plea, El Asael, towards Asael, telling him, I'm telling you, abandon this chase. Why should I smite you to the ground? In other words, in the last Pasuk, he was only hinting to him. He's telling him, go get one of your lads and put on his coat and hide out. Like, leave me alone. Now he's telling him, if you don't leave me alone, I'm going to kill you. How will I ever look at your, of your brother if I have to kill you? Leave me alone. Verse 23, he refuses. And Asael continues to chase Avner. So Avner has no choice. Avner strikes him with the back of his dagger, with the back of his sword, in the belly. And he does so with such force, perhaps because of the running of Asael being so fast, and with his pursuit, that the sword goes all the way through Asael and comes out the other end of his body. And he falls there, and he dies, <clears throat> and he dies. But he And this stops the pursuit. Apparently, everybody else, Asael was leading the charge, running after Avner and his men. And when Asael falls and dies, everyone else who's in hot pursuit, they they stop. They refuse to go beyond Asael where he dies, and the chase ends. And that's that's the end of the. The confrontation as it is at this moment. Yeah. Right. It's a good question. It might be that Asael wanted to, I don't know, I'm not sure, maybe capture him, tackle him. Maybe he didn't think about that point. Asael may not have had a weapon with him. I don't, I'm not sure. Right. It seems like he's there to go ahead and kill him. Avnana seems to hold his own but he does a surprise um, attack towards Asael that he's not ready for. And that's why Asael dies. Yeah. Um, and it's, the, it's a terrible loss, as we're going to see. He stands out because of how good a soldier he is and the fact that he's the brother of Yoav bin Siruya. It's a devastating loss for them. Um, verse 24, though, the chase still doesn't end. Um, verse 24, The other two brothers, even though everyone else has stopped, you can imagine the other two brothers just watched their brother die at the hands of Avner. So they continue the pursuit. Avner. Finally, the sun is setting. 
והם הבאו עד גבעת, גבעת עמה, they come to the hill of עמה, אשר על פני גיח, which faces גיח, דרך מדבר גבעון, towards the wilderness of גבעון. והתקבצו בני בנימין אחר אבנר. Now גבעון is a stronghold of the people of בנימין. So now here you have two people, Yoav and Avishai, chasing after Avner, and Avner takes refuge in the hills of Giv'on, where his people are, and all the people of Binyamin come out to defend him. And they form a single company. And they took a position at the top of the hill. Verse 26, Avner knows he's finally safe. So he calls to Yoav. Vayikra Avner el Yoav. Yoav is called by Avner. Vayomer, and he says to him, Halanetzach toh al cherev. Must the sword devour us forever? How much longer is the fighting going to go on? Avner is saying to Yoav, Halo yadata ki marati ye ba'aharona. You know how bitterly it's going to end. Wink, wink, just like it did for your brother. Ve'ad matai lo tomar ne'am. How much longer are you not going to tell the people lashuv me'ahare ahahim to run, to return from pursuing their brothers. In other words, let's end this civil war. Now, before we read Yoav's answer, Avner is telling Yoav, let's stop the battle. What's so ironic about that? He started it. Yoav was the one who suggested the battle, the play fight in the first place. Uh, Avner, excuse me. Avner was the one who, who suggested it. So, when you're reading this story, remember I told you, think about who's to blame. Who would you say seems to be to blame for this story? I'd put Avner at the center of it. Avner was the one who seemingly initiated the confrontation. He's the one who said, let's make a battle. He's the one who put in Ishboshet as the king when he knew it should have been David. He's the one who killed Asael. Avner seems to be the major culprit of this. And he's the one who's telling you, Av, Let's 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 stop it here. You know how this is going to end. Let's stop it here. Huh? He's he's not going to. Oh oh, he didn't have to take the. He didn't have to agree to it. True. Yoav definitely is not. He's not blameless. He started. He he participated in it. He could have separated from it. But I mean, it seems as though Avner is really the the bad guy in this whole story. True, Avner is also losing, right? So he may be the one who's calling on Yoav to stop. But then if you're Yoav, what's your response? Yeah, I'm not, you now you want to stop, right? Oh, now we're going to stop. Because A, you're losing, and B, you were the one who started this whole thing. So that's exactly what he says in verse 27. Yoav, Yoav says to him, Chai Elohim, as God lives, Ki dibarta, if you hadn't been the one to speak up, Ki az ha'am, the troops would have given, um, if you hadn't spoken up, the troops would have given up the pursuit of their kinsmen. Each person from his brother. Verse 28, Yoav blows the shofar, and the people stop. They would no longer pursue and chase after their brothers of Israel. They do not continue to fight. Avner and his people walked through the Arava, through the wilderness all night. They cross the Jordan. And they go through the Bitron and they come to a place, come back to their original spot, Mahanaim. Verse 30, Avner. Yoav gave up the pursuit of Avner, despite the fact that he killed his brother. And he gathers his people. And he counts how many people he lost. He wants to figure out what was the death toll from the people of David. Tisha Asar Ish, 19 men, Va Asael, and Asael. Notice how the text separates Asael from the count to show you how important an individual he was. It's 19 people and Asael. Asael on his own was enough of a devastating loss to, to put Yoav in his camp, um, you know, reeling. Verse 31, on the other hand, as we've talked about the numbers who won and lost. Verse 31, the servants of David, the soldiers, hit from Binyamin, Avner, and from the people of Avner, 360 people die. So in total, the death toll is 380 people between the two sides over a play fight and a confrontation that probably could have been avoided. 
Verse 32, They carry Asael, his corpse, and they bury him in the grave of his fathers um, in Bethlehem. And Yoav and his men walk the entire night. And then the day breaks and the sun comes up as they reach Hebron, which again is their stronghold where David is. So that's the end of the story. A very strange story, a very tragic story, um, but a story that enters us into a conflict that is going to have much bloodshed. Who is going to take over for Shaul and how will this confrontation work out is a point that we're going to continue to have issues with as the chapter moves, as the chapters move on and on. But now I want to try and break down a little bit of what took place. Now that we understand the whole story, and we were quick to say that Avner is the one, and truly Avner definitely is the more of the villainous character over here. But you wonder, how was it that Avner could look Yoav in the face and say, Avner, Yoav, you know, let's call it quits. Let's, let's stop. Did Yoav and his men play a part in initiating this battle? So Rabbi Bazak wants to claim that they did. In a very subtle way, we actually see that Yoav and his men did something to provoke Avner. So Avner is definitely the deceitful villain, as we've already painted him. But Yoav and his men are not blameless here. They did a provocation. What do you think that was? Or are you going to say something else? Yeah. Why did they go to the pool in the first place? Indeed. Go back to verse, go back to the very beginning of the story. The way it's phrased is very interesting. And I didn't harp on it then because I wanted to leave it, but I will harp on it now. Go back to verses 12 and 13. Right. Right. Exactly. So that's where we need to understand give on and we need to understand who provoked who. Yoav and his men do do a little bit of a provoke here. In verse 12, it says, Vayetze Avner Bener. Avner Bener and his men go out. In verse 13, it says, Vyoav ben Tsiruya ve'avde David yatsu. What does yatsu mean? In, no, it's in, it's in what tense? It's in the past. In other words, they were already there. What are the Pesukim hinting to us? Why did Avner leave Machanaim to go to give on. Why did he do that? Because who started to go to give on? Yoav. Yoav and his men made a power play. They said, we need, if we're going to get David's kingdom to be promoted, we need to take hold or to make a presence in another significant place. What is that other significant place? Give on. Why is give on so significant? What's in give on? So it is a religiously charged place because it was where Yehoshua made a great miracle for the Jewish people. So it has a lot of religious significance. Check off that box. Remember, it's religious significance. What else is there? What physical thing is there? The Mishkan. The Mishkan is in Giv'on. Yes. The Mishkan after the Mishkan. It's hard. The Mishkan was in Shiloh, remember. That was where it stood. It stood there for 369 years until the Pelishkim destroyed it, right? It then moved to Nov. And Nov was destroyed by whom? Shaul. Shaul killed all the Kohanim and obliterated the town, right? And then Shemuel dies. The rabbis say when Shemuel dies and Shaul destroyed Nov, where did the Mishkan move to? It moved to Gibbon. It says it. I'll bring you the Pasuk. That it says that it says it in. It's in Divre. It's in Divre. No, and you don't remember it because it's in Divre Hayamim. It's at the end, all the way at the end of the book of Chronicles. In Divre Hayamim, it says, Umishkan Hashem Asher Asa Moshe Bamidbar, Umizbah Haola Baetahi Babama Begivon. At that time, was in with the with the big altar in Givon. So we have not seen the the the, the the Bama and the Mishkan moved to give on, but from other sources, we know that that's where it was. So what does Yoav want to do? He wants to make a power play. We got to move David's camp along a little bit. Let's make our way to give on. And give on is very close to the territory of Binyamin. At that time, Binyamin, why was it in give on? It was moved to give on because Shaul's kingdom was there. That's where Binyamin was. This is a major play on the part of Yoav and his camp 
to say, they're making a statement, we're taking over the Mishkan, we're taking over this area from the people of Binyamin. And so we're going to make a presence here and that's going to ascend David to the throne. When Avner heard that, he said, oh, no, 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 no. You're not going to come and take over our territory in Giv'on and pretend that this is your territory. This is our territory. By Yetzeh Avner, Avner goes out to defend Giv'on. And Yoav had already come out. And now they stand on the opposite side of the pool, one at the other, but there's major tension. Because everybody knows what happened here. They didn't just happen to frolic one day and find each other on the sides. There was strategy, there was political strategy that each side was trying to do over here. And so the tension is palatable. It makes for an eruption, which is exactly what takes place. But Yoav and his men are not blameless. They were the ones who provoked the Avner and his men to come out and defend their territory. And that's exactly what they do. Now, it was Avner's suggestion to start a play fight and to do that uh, 12 people versus 12 people. It was Avner who shouldn't have crowned Ishboshet in the first place. It was Avner who killed Asael. Definitely, he's, he's the stands at the forefront of this issue, but it's not as if Yoav and his men did not do anything to, uh, to provoke them. And so both sides have to claim some level of blame, and that's probably what Yoav, Av, Avner, excuse me, was hinting to Yoav when he said, Yoav, how much longer are you going to do this, right? It's only going to end bitterly. Take your people and go to where you don't belong because you don't belong. It just seems like, it just seems like, a, right. It just seems like chaos ensues and the battle erupts. I'm not so sure. Oh, you're saying because why? Because it told us that he ruled for two years? Yeah. But I think that's giving us his timeline in general. In general? Yeah. I think that's giving us the overview. Are there yeah. But it, it's definitely happening within those two years. Right. But but it was, a, it was a major move. It was a major move on the part of Yoav to try and seek out that territory and to try to take it over. There's no question about it. You'll see. <laughs> yeah. David is seven and a half. And yeah, there's going to be another person, Mifi Boshit. And there's going to be some other people who come in as well. So there's going to be there's going to be some more tension that even after Ish Boshit is off the scene, there's going to be another person. David is not going to have a shortage of oppositions. And then once he becomes king, he'll have more opposition. So his whole life is oppositions towards him, towards him taking over the throne. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Of Shalom. That's David's, that's David's son. Yeah. Yeah, that's David's son. That's after David already took hold of it. That's going to happen a little bit later. The rabbis end with, an, I want to end just with a statement that the rabbis make on Avner in the Yerushalmi Masechet Pe'ah. They say, Avner lama neherad. Why was Avner eventually killed, as we will see in the coming chapters? Rabbi Yoshua ben Nevi, Amar Rabbi Yoshua ben Nevi says, Al she'asad damam shel ne'arim schok. Because he played around with the blood of young people. The fact that he could so callously suggest, let's just throw a couple of young guys in the middle and let them duke it out and see what happens. Even that on its own was very insensitive, very, very insensitive. It's something you do with your finding Goliath. It's not something you do when you're dealing with problems internally within the Jewish people. So that Avner could suggest such an insensitive idea to be willing to lose Jewish blood over this conflict was already something that you see the type of personality in which he had, right? So he's, an, he's a conflicted figure, right? And the only reason why he doesn't want to kill Asael, the only reason why he gives Asael so much leeway is why he's afraid of looking Yoav in the face. He says, how am I going to look Yoav in the face? I know they're going to want to kill him, which by the way, that's exactly what happens. Yoav is going to avenge the death of his brother by killing Avner. But that's the only reason why Avner is afraid. He has no problem taking matters into his own hands and killing him. I want to just spend another 30 seconds at the very end of the chapter with a little bit of a positive note, something that we saw earlier. If you take a look at the very last Pesukim, it describes Avner and his people traveling in darkness. It says that they traveled all night long. I think it's Pasuk, um, where is it? Pasuk, Lamed Bet. Uh, Lamed Bet is the one about, about Yoav and his people. 
um, Chavtet, 29. Yes. It tells us Avner and his people walked through the night. Period. Then at the very last Pasuk, the one Julie brought up on Lamid Bet, it says that Yoav and his men walked the night. And then day broke and light came up in Hebron. What do you notice about the contrast there? Exactly. Avner and his people and Shaul's camp are in the dark. David and his people are in the light. In other words, who won the battle? David and his men. Terrible casualties. They were at fault to, to a certain point. But all of the signs over here are pointing towards the ascension of David and his people. The light is shining on them. They know that they're going to be successful. The darkness is on Shaul and his people. And we already saw that going back to the end of Shemuel Bet, when, Sha when Shaul was uh, going to the woman, right? The necromance woman in the middle of the night and he's stealth and he's hidden and he's covered. Everything about Shaul and his people for many, many chapters already has all been in the darkness, hidden, covered. David and his people are ascending. They're up, they're light. So that textual... Uh, that, that usage that uh, they call it a thing of sifruti, that uh, what's the language I'm looking for in the English when you use like, uh, I don't know, some textual play, right? That, 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 that writing strategy is to point us, although we suffered a terrible loss here, in general, David is still, his stock is still on the rise. Shaul is still uh, falling downward. So we're going to see how the battle continues to ensue. The first pasuk of the next chapter talks about how the battle between Bet Shaul and Bet David continued to rage on for much time and how David is going to try and unite the kingdom under his banner and avoid more and more of these types of devastating incidences is going to be the topic as we, uh, as we move forward. Okay, we, uh, no class next week. We'll probably resume on the Monday after Pesach.